is happening guys? Welcome to FPL Surgery. My name is David and with me as always is Rich. And today we are going to be doing the eight simple rules series where we have written, pre-written some rules to try and help the average manager increase their rank, a better rank, a better overall rank. And then we bring a bunch of awesome managers in to tell us how good our rules are. This episode we have the incredible, the amazing, the one, the only Tom. Tom, how's it going, man? Good, good. Yeah, I think that you've again mislabeled me as a good manager. Um, I'm here as a gobby manager, a manager who's <laughs> able to articulate himself well, probably. Um, but I'm not a particularly good manager these days. I have not, I've never been able to reconcile being a content creator uh, with being able to smash out decent ranks, as I believe Rich, you found a couple of, last year, just from your first year in surgery. It can be quite a difficult yeah. thing to do. Um, <laughs> Yep. So, um, <laughs> My voice went uh, a yeah. bit there. I'm, I'm He's just, very upset uh, about it. <laughs> I'm just, just uh, putting it out there. Um, but I love that you, very... you were the first person that has brought it up that wasn't me. <laughs> like I, I love to bring it up. He's had a bad season last time, and it's one of the first things you said. Yeah, fair, fair enough. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also always really glad to come with you guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, no, thanks for coming on, Tom. And honestly i think last season i did i had a new respect for people who create content because i realized you i don't know you feel like i don't know if you feel this way but i i'd give an opinion on the podcast and then i'd feel like actually i do know you feel this way but i had i gave an opinion on the podcast and then i felt like i had to go through with it or felt more pressure to go through with it even though maybe yeah. four or five days later i changed my mind slightly i don't know yeah, it's called sunk cost fallacy, and um, that's the idea that because you've sunk a lot of uh, expenditure and um, resource by way of research or by way of, as you said, attaching your own sense of um, your own sense of uh, value onto what you've said, mm. you've, got, you've got to go through it. And that was something I did in the first kind of couple of years, where I def I felt like, oh my god, you know, on on Monday night I said, oh Pogba, uh, you've got to get this guy, you know, he, he's just absolutely smashing it. And then kind of by Thursday, I'd be thinking, oh, actually, you know, Rashford, the, the, the team he's playing next, they're, they're really susceptible down his side. Oh, I should really get Rashford. No, no, but I've said Pogba. I've got to do Pogba. People are going to be dragging me out through the streets of Twitter and smashing me in, figurative, in the face figuratively. Um, mm. And once I got over that, I managed to improve a tiny bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, hopefully one day I'll be really good. But at the moment, it's, it's not quite happened. Well, it's a good segue into into what kind of manager you are in general. So you've got obviously over your your Pogba Rashford stuff and your total sum gain. What was it? The the philosophy there that you just said? A uh, sunk cost fallacy. That's, the fallacy, um, even. It's, yeah, there's a behavioral science podcast out there that's worth listening to, um, which goes through all of these things um, that we did over the summer. Yeah, no, I, I I remember doing it last year and just like blitzing through them and trying to learn as as much as i can and then like my brain started melting and i had to like yeah. listen to them over and over again um, and it finally sort of sunk in for at least one season but um anyway so what type of manager are you what would you say if 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 you had to like sum up how you play in average every season um i am a risky manager masquerading as a template manager masquerading as a good manager masquerading as a bad manager <laughs> basically um i used to be very good when i was looking i mean it, when it was just all like the mini leagues for me i had no vestige of what top 10 kor actually meant i didn't really care about it i had no vestige yeah. of you know top one percent i used to see everywhere um whenever i went online uh, on twitter and the first kind of the first time i saw all these things i was like what the hell are these and at the moment i detached myself from my mini league and just thinking about that and thinking about the wider sort of sense of, of kind of fpl i just i just kind of lost what i was good at and lost what i particularly did um to make me win those mini leagues and yeah like from kind of doing post hoc evaluations of the kind of player that i am it seems like there's two things. One is that I always try to be too clever. Right. And that kind of has cost me a lot. So where the likes of Late Riser and um, Mark Sovens will make a kind of fairly risky pick and it will, it will kind of work out for them a lot because there's a kind of reason judgments behind that. Yeah. And a lot of the time I've kind of gambled with captaincy, for example. I know we're going to come on to that on the symbol rules. And that's just plainly not worked for me over the last few years. And like I've, I've kind of 
ends up becoming a bit of a mush, basically, because you've got your own <laughs> ideas. I mean, you log on to Twitter, I mean, you see what all the herd are thinking, and you read all the articles, see the captain polls, you see, you know, all the conversations which are going on in all the group chats with better managers than you. And you kind of think, oh, you know, oh, well, you know, I have my own thoughts, but you know, all of these things are sort, of, are sort of going on. And why wouldn't I listen to this guy? This guy knows what he's doing and so on and so forth. And yeah. I kind of was always quite of a risky sort of trailblazer manager, the kind of guy who got, you know, Troy Deeney in for, uh, and captained him on minus eight and he sort of braced in the last minute. And um, I was always that kind of guy. And I kind of went from that to being quite a safe manager, but a really bad safe manager. <laughs> a sort of manager who's like playing it safe at like, yeah. You know, 300k like what am i doing um so this year you know i'm going to try to be a bit more uh play into who i actually am in accordance with um the behavioral science podcast we did over yeah. the summer um and i think that i guess uh, i'm going to try to reconnect to my roots as being uh, a bit more risk taking at least with the transfers that i make and and the way that i um carve up my team between safe picks and differentials which again we're going to come on to shortly yeah so it's kind of like the perfect time to have you on for the eight simple rules then because last season uh we did this and it was very i mean we had some really great discussions um but it was very uh, obvious that we were kind of similar in, in our safety um disagreeing on a few things but by and large we were quite on the same page but this season if you're going to be trying to find your risky roots um <laughs> then uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see what you've what you've got for us today uh, shall we get into it yeah, let's. So I'm really looking for. Actually, I don't want to spoil it, but there's one in particular I'm looking forward to after listening to a couple of pods you've recorded in the last couple of weeks. Um, so, Dave, did you want to start with the with the first first rule? Yes, uh, the first rule: template team to start the season. Um, this rule is, is very simple. It's play safe to start. Don't do anything maverick. Don't go too differential. Just play the template. Try and get a good hold on the game, and it allows you to attack players that are doing well um, in the first couple of game weeks instead of trying to fix mistakes from from poor differential choices. So template team to start. What are you thinking, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect, because right. Rule two. The like, the, <laughs> yeah, the, the likes of FPL general rule, the likes of um, ubiquitous, everyone knows who he is, um, and Abdul, FPL Salah. Yeah. And both of them last year did exactly this. Like they just went, no, you know, I'm not buying the likes of you know, Timo Werner. I'm not interested in these guys. I'm going to get really, you know, all of their first 11, I think game week one were all solid picks. You know, there was no one new to the, like, to the league, no one who had been transferred in, no one had been promoted. And they got, up to, got, got off to a really, really solid start. And obviously I'm worried about recency bias. So I'm worried about the fact that maybe that was just kind of what happened last year. And maybe yeah. you, you kind of think about things like, you know, oh, you know, back in the day, buying Mo Salah the first game week, that was great. If you'd have bought Timo Puki, um, Timu, Timu Puki two years ago, that would have been great. You know, game week one, you kind of would have got the hat trick game week two and brilliant. Yeah. Um, but I think overall, it is definitely something where you kind of would want to uh, um, err on the side of caution. Normally as well, you don't get a situation where you've got a very high ownership for more than, say, one newly promoted player. So the player that I've got in mind at the moment who perhaps is that guy is obviously Ivan Tony, um, who I think he's owned, he's the most owned forward, that's for sure. I think yeah. he's about 35. 35% last time I checked. Something like that last time I checked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like sometimes you might look at a player like that and think, oh, actually, I've got to probably own that guy just to cover my, uh, my backside. Am I going to be doing that? I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, I've I've got like a, perhaps a punt elsewhere, but I, I mean my team is so in the air. I've got no idea at the moment, and I'm probably not going to commit to anything at this at this point. But Did you just open like, it up there? I seen the the light like kind of flash. Yeah, the light there. yeah. <laughs> I I just can't. I just can't like. I I think having the the established player. Something that I'm going to veer towards. I think I, with the likes of Tony, you can watch and wait and see what happens with them. Last year, like it was actually okay starting with Kai, Kai Havertz because I could then swap. He's um, a very him, good price him, point, yeah. Him for him for somebody else. So yeah, it was nice to be able to trade down. But overall, I think having that kind of established pedigree in your team, for the most part, um, if you are kind of minded uh, towards the Tony punt and like that, is probably the way to go. Um, uh, it's it's full, but anticipate, anticipate the template, I guess. Um, it is an interesting one where you've got someone who who kind of breaks rules of safety in that you know we tend not to get players that haven't played in the Premier League or you know promoted players until they prove that they can do it unless they're fodder like Lundstrom. Um, 
but then you know Tony's kind of hitting both nails almost in 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 that in that aspect. Like he's high owned. He seems like he's gonna be template, but also you know he breaks those rules for mention. So it will be interesting to see yeah. exactly what's happening with that. It's interesting when you have players like, for example, Abamyang, Vardy, Mane, where they proved they can do it in the past. But and I know you mentioned recency bias, but they've not done it that recently. I mean, maybe in Mane's case, he has. So, I mean, how would you value them compared to, say, someone like Tony, who we've not seen in the Premier League at all? Uh, well, I mean, it's price, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, you, and, you, you, yeah. Can't, you can't really put them in the same bracket. All right, same pretend bracket. Tony um, was 11 million. Right, go. <laughs> well, yeah, but so Tony's an 11 million newly promoted player. Yeah. Again, it doesn't really quite work, does it? No. I see what you're getting at, but I think you're trying to create a false economy there. Um, so <laughs> yeah, a I little probably, one. probably was. A I mean, one. one thing I'd say about Tony compared to, say, like Werner last year, he was obviously new to the league, but mm. he, he was more expensive. Yeah. Whereas Tony is that budget. Yeah. Very, yeah. Very There's a lot less friendly. risk. Price. A lot less risk. Yeah, it's throw away, isn't it? So you're able to say, you know what, it doesn't go well. Uh, people do get worried, and maybe what I'm saying is also kind of countermanded by this. People do get worried and go, oh, no, but if you get him, you'll be stuck with him at that price point. There's no one to go to. And you, you've got to be thinking to yourself, well, actually, you know, you can just trade someone else out. I mean, you've got, you've got yeah. these magical things called transfers. Um, <laughs> it's there's never always Josh King at 5.5. Yeah, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Don't, please true. don't. Watch true. Troy Dean can make a comeback in your team. You never know. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it is one of those things which is quite hard to do. But yeah, I think overall, I'd agree with this rule 95%. Um, right. like maybe there is sometimes a cause. Like Jaden Sancho, for example. So Sancho joins the Premier League. Um, would I be surprised to see him return game week one? Absolutely not. Yeah, fair play. So the second rule we've got um, is basically it's a rule that came in. Well, it's not a rule, um, mm. but, you know, to use price, price points to balance team. Um, so defenders, do you go for premium defend? Do you go, for example, for one premium defender, one premium midfielder and one premium striker? Or do you not care that much about price points? I would never artificially impose some sort of structure or apparatus of kind of choosing onto the season because like sometimes a lot of time doesn't fit. Like if if you look at this season and we've we've done the price initial price kind of shakedown, we're gonna do a proper one in August when we're about recording again properly. Yeah. But like this season a lot of it is a little bit a lot of players are in by default. So it depends like if you're off the wall and you're kind of looking at Edison in goal and you don't really care about defense and you're setting up in the really old school three four three with nothing in defense, not very much midfield and everything up front, then cool, you know, fair enough. But the majority of the kind of the herd these days will kind of start up in a very that, that sort of price pointy way by quite yeah. naturally. Um I think this year there's a few there are a couple of 5.5s in the mix so maybe this year we'll see the vaunted big at the back come into play you know the likes of luke shaw who's the second highest owned player at the moment at the time of recording like absolute fomo monster that one that's and then scary. luca dean i think worth looking at so that's 2.5.5s trent if you don't have him or don't consider him i mean we can't be friends um, <laughs> and then mr, mr. lamptey x lamptey and harrison like uh, sorry and ailing like those are players that or ailing or for far like these are players like you've got that kind of sliding scale in, in defense already yeah I think midfield's where it's interesting though because you've got Salah and Bruno I know there's loads of people who are no brew rather than Bruno um but at the same time like for me those two according to talisman theory and just just according to logic are pretty essential picks to begin with at least yeah um <laughs> I and mean, then after that, you've got a bit of a drop off, haven't you? So, for example, at the moment, I've got Jota. Um, I, I'm not very comfortable with having Jota, but I've got Jota sat there. Um, but then after that, I've got you know Harrison and Smith Rowe. But that kind of from 12 million to 7.5 million, that's quite a precipice, isn't it? And there's quite a lot of flexibility, I think, in kind of the third midfielder slot. I think that that's probably one where it's hard to say um, that you're going to be filling into price points as you would have been in years past. Because I, I yeah. just think there's a kind of a, bit of a gap there. Like, you know, there's obviously the Kai Havertz, who I was talking about um, a little while ago on a, a podcast I did, on the first podcast we did back. But I, I just, I think that this year, for example, it just doesn't quite work for me. If you look at Harry Kane as well, like you might be saying, according to that principle, you've got to get Kane in because you've got to have premium forward covered. Yeah. But then again, you know, the uncertainty over Kane and the fact that you've got the likes of Wilson 
Dominic Carver Lewin, Watkins, Ike and Acho all sat around kind of the lower the, the mid high range forwards uh, yeah. in terms of value. Sorry, in terms of price. Is that even worth it? Like, I, I don't really know if either of you are starting with Kane, but for me it, it doesn't feel like it's always applicable to have something like that. A lot of the time it's more about basing what you do on the price set in front of you rather than kind of trying to impose a structure onto that price set. That makes sense. Yeah, no, it does make sense. I mean, it's a funny one this year because like you mentioned with Kane, there is that massive drop off, uh, drop off after Kane where you, you know, Vardy's 10 and a half million, then it's 2 million more for Kane. So you're not really holding, like you're not, you're not got that thing like last year where people had Kane in case they wanted to switch to Aguero. Yeah. You haven't got that kind of scenario. So you're dropping down anyway, then you've got a mm-hmm. lot of money in the bank that you want to spend. So you're probably spending two transfers if you want to have all your funds on the table, as it were. Yeah, it's almost like it takes the risk out. So obviously this this a very big um, contention in preseason last last year. Um, but now because of how the prices have fell and where our risk players versus our safe players and, and their price points, it kind of means that when we when we decide whether we're picking Kane or not, the ability to get to him easily by using price points is a good thing. It's, a, it's obviously a positive, but the risk of not being able to get to him isn't very yeah, high yeah. because so many people are not going to be able, they're going to be in the same boat as you. Everyone's picking Tony, DCL and, and whoever, Wilson or whatever. So it means that everyone's going to be in the same boat. Whereas last time you had like 40% on Werner and they're only what, two, 2 million away from, or 1 million yeah. away from both Vardy and uh, Kane, and then a million more away from Aguero. So there was a lot of Certainly, risk yeah. from being able to jump. So that's a very good point, actually, that this this rule might not be so applicable this year, um, at least in the in the striker department, for, for, for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, this next rule, I'm looking forward to this one. Is this the one that you tried to not spoil at the very start? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Triple captain no sorry simple captain choices triple captain choices no, yeah. all right go for it <laughs> well, don't don't start rich with that by the way he'll just talk about phone for an hour um simple so, captain choices what are you thinking yes but i'm not going to be picking them myself i've decided <laughs> um so the first pod back um i obviously i've done like a retrospective i think i use something called fpl retro do the retrospective of my team and you know it kind of spits out everything that you've got from you know, points game from captaincy points game via transfer you know points burnt points benched your yeah. top 11 all sort of, sort of stuff um, and the big one for me is captain and i said on the, that first part back i remember distinctly saying this exact thing three seasons in a row so every season the wash up I, and or the first one back, I'd say, oh, you know what, Nick? My captain was absolutely diabolical last year. I only got 500 or you know, 600 or you know, 100 below what the average was. Yeah. And it was the same last year. So I've kind of come to the conclusion that I'm absolutely terrible at picking captains. I'm just not good at it. And the fact is that, you know, my um, propensity to overthink and to try to be too clever it just just gets to me when it comes to this very very sort of essential part of fpl because after all you can have a terrible season but you can mask it paper over the cracks by just getting good captaincy because you know if the rest of your team scores 20 and the captain scores 40 then you're okay <laughs> you are okay and, I, and i've um i had so many yeah. occasions last year where my the rest of my team did very well. The rest of my team would get you know forty fifty points between them. And you know, if my captain had done well, if I no, I'm talking about things like not captaining Bruno against West Brom. If I'd not captained the obvious pick, sorry, if I'd captained the obvious pick, then I'd have had a home run of a game week. Yeah. But as it was, I just kept shooting myself in the foot by overthinking it, by thinking, well, you know what? West Brom are going to keep Bruno at bay and Man United aren't very good against the low block. So yeah, all the algos are pointing that way. But haha, screw you all. I'm going to do something. And obviously it didn't materialize. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is take the responsibility out of my own hands and kind of correspond to what this is, uh, what this kind of question is. Um, sorry, what this rule is. We've um, been doing that all time as well, calling them questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, t- in terms of simple caps, in terms of uh, simple captaincies, because yeah. I'm going to keep it simple by basically going with Mikel's algorithm. I know you guys are big proponents of that, mm-hmm. and that's where I hear yeah. about it a lot, actually. Um, but I'll be going with basically whatever Mikel's algorithm spits out, 
um, and that will be my captain this year. I'm completely abdicating responsibility because I'm not very good at it, um, yeah. at captains, that is. Um, if I don't own the player, then I've got to make a bit of a decision about whether I cap- bring them in or not. So, for example, Game Week 2 this year, I'm sure Mikel's algorithm is going to be absolutely cock-a-hoop um, <laughs> yeah. about Kevin De Bruyne against Norwich, for example. Am I going to want to bring Kevin De Bruyne in that week, or do I go with his second choice? Um, I, I, that's the decision I'll have to make at that point. But you know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm, I'm going to just completely add the capability of captaincy. So, yeah, simple captain choices, but it's kind of guided, informed in single captain choices, simple captain choices on top of that. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Oh, 100%. I, I, re- I really like that idea because I mean, I remember last year saying to Josh so many times, I'd look at the Mikhail's algorithm and honestly, he generally, I wish I had the stats in front of me because. He generally picked the top scoring captain. Yeah, yeah. On, I, think it was on like most weeks. I think it was 650 points. Um, the captain algorithm got last year. I, I think it was. I think it was that. That sounds. That sounds. It rings a bell for that. And like I, you know, I sat there in four nine four, and I I kind of saw you know the likes of Fabio Borge, uh, mm-hmm. one of the big ones, um, who said that you know every week that would be the deciding factor for him. What the Mikel's algorithm spat out, and I know Josh Moore is cheating. Also follows that. Yeah. And you you kind of looking at these kind of you know top top managers and thinking oh crap you know maybe there's something I can learn. Oh my maybe there's something I can learn from that you know. Yeah. Um. So. Advocating responsibility, simple caption choices, made even more simple by yeah. not making a decision yourself. I, 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 do, I do like it. I, just, <laughs> I think the reason I couldn't do it is just like I'd get itchy feet. I'd get a little bit. I don't know. I, I like thinking I'm having an impact and making a decision. Even, and I'm almost disappointed when Mikel has Salah top captain. You know, for the for the third week in a row. Yeah, there is no fate but what we make for ourselves. Terminator two, right? No hits. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you had to you had to source that. Well, as well. no one. Uh, you guys just. Uh, I'm not. I'm not crazy. I, I'm not making up my own massively. We could be sitting here talking about phrases. <laughs> we could be talking about whether we live in the Matrix and whether anything we do matters at all for a long time. Trust me, because it's one of my favorite movies. But have you seen the film? Have you seen that film about living in the Matrix? <gasps> 20 minutes later. Are you guys even real? Like, I've met Dave once. Obviously, I've rich, but. How do I not know that you're both not automatons? Like, I don't see you other than this little, little window. Exactly. Like, you could, as soon as this window closes, you guys could just be like, Spanish, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. And you could just be reactivated to go into drinking mode. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Saturday. we should just scrap <laughs> these rules and we'll just talk about this. <laughs> Six hours later. If you haven't at one point thought you might be in the Truman Show in like a mass universe version of the Truman Show, then you're not really thinking about it. You're not really like, thinking properly because that, that should be something. Both films I've ever seen. Yeah. It's 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 great. You should watch it. Truman Show and Terminator Two, by the way, because that's also very good. Um, no hits. <laughs> what are we thinking? Because that that was a very good point that you made with the Kevin De Bruyne game week two thing. So I'm I'm assuming that you've got uh, a choice to make in regards with are we going to do hits or captaincies or anything. But in general, this rule is 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 it's not so much saying no hits because obviously we're going to have to throw the caveats of of my Aubameyang's got malaria or whatever and all that stuff that that, that generally happens to everyone. Um, one of the main things um, that this is supposed to be signifying is is simply just you know what you're doing stop it stop it that hit you don't need to do that you want to do it but you don't need to do that let's just try and minimize everything um what are you thinking Hmm, i mean no hits i as i said i'm quite a risk-taking manager who's been masquerading as a template manager yeah so i said kind of the first pod back in terms of my objectives this year the other objective was that if there was a 50 50 i would take the hit so in the past, mm. my 55th, I've not been trusting my instinct. I've just been kind of thinking, well, I'm going to kind of, you know, keep it, keep the points to myself, et cetera, et cetera. And at times that number, I was so angry just because, like, I, I, I kind of missed out on the points for a player. You know, even down to the one that really sticks in my crawl is last year, early on, um, I said to somebody, Oh, do you reckon it's worth uh, taking a minus four for Martinez? Um, I think I had you know, uh, <laughs> Alex McCarthy or something. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, Martinez has got a great run of fixtures and he looks really solid. And uh, and, uh, and everyone's like, oh, no, don't, don't do that. That's, that's a bit of a waste of time. I, I really had a strong feeling about it, but I kind of thought, you know what? You know, this yeah. group chat, 
fair enough, kosher, you know, they're great managers. Um, and I didn't do it. And obviously it's an extreme variant situation, but he then went on to save that penalty. Um, against, I think it was against Sheffield United. Uh, and then I was like, you know, I was just... I was just in despair. Like I couldn't look at FPL for the rest of the week, the rest of the game week, because all I could see was that sort of fifteen pointer, like you know, staring me in the face. And I was like, yeah. oh my lord. And um, so, I mean, I've got to kind of play into the sort of manager that I am, and I think that I'm actually quite a hit friendly manager. And I found that last year as well, when I did, when I did my sort of you know season review, as I mentioned earlier on, uh-huh. that. I actually managed to get more points, um, you know, from making those um, transfers than people like Nick, people like Sir Anthony. I was able to do that. It was just the fact is that the captaincy and a couple of other aspects had let me down a lot. Um, the other aspect is not having an 11th man. Um, so yeah. I've, my instinct tends to be pretty good. It's just the fact that you kind of get that moderated by all the Twitter stuff. Yeah, um, I can understand why you know. Like, I think Paul Sky player in FPL, great example of somebody who doesn't take hits and always does well. So maybe there is something to learn there for 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 that. But I'm not that sort of guy, and I need to kind of to enhance or shore up my enjoyment of FPL. I'm I'm not sure I can subscribe to the no hits theory. I mean, Dave, do you even manage to do this? Did you do this last year with no hits? I did. I think five hits which was my lowest ever i think it was five or six and it was like i don't know like 12 less than the year before and and a lot more than the the best year but my best year i, I was taking hits all the time like i I, yeah. I feel like it it really does depend whether you have a good instinct or not if you feel like yeah. you know what you have a good instinct then then go for it but the average manager does not have a good instinct and so therefore um this is to try and kind of stave away that sure. that temptation sure. but but for for people who who have been doing it as long as you have and 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 have decided like you know what me not taking hits isn't really paying off and and every time i miss out on a on a on a massive haul it's usually because and you have to be honest with yourself like we we at the start of the season will have put almost every player in our team so obviously <laughs> yeah. naturally you're gonna get like oh you know i should have had tony because he was in my 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 first ever draft and and then i didn't have him and now he's hauled like i don't mean that i mean like if you genuinely were about to like press the button or as you said a 50 50 on whether you want to take the hit or not and you decided in the end i'm just going to leave it and then they go on to do good things and that was a good instinct that you had that you didn't that you didn't jump on it then absolutely i yeah, totally agree yeah, with exactly. you but this is not for the, those people <laughs> those but, but i totally get where you're coming from i really like your answer i think it's also something you can look back on with with a bit of hindsight and say you know be pleased that you did a hit because i think generally would you want to do a hit for a goalkeeper and i, I guess that kind of moves on to our to our next rule Go for it. So the next rule is a minimal core team transfers. So you have that core of players. So, for example, a key one would probably be a goalkeeper, some might say. Um, so how do you feel about this rule? And I guess if we start with with the goalies. Um, what is your core team? What What is your core team? So I would say it would be your premiums. Um, right. Potentially. The, yeah, the, uh, the, the premiums, the very, very budget players. And I'd say goalkeepers as well, but I know you just made a really good point on Martinez. And if you'd done a hit for Martinez, that would have easily paid I off. Feel like that's because you had McCarthy. That was a high. Um, <laughs> that was a, that was a high event. Well, I mean, yeah, McCarthy could have could have saved the pen that week as well. So that's a very kind of high variance situation. But was that that was game week two, wasn't it? Yeah, was it, it, was, it was very. It, I think it, I think it was game week three, but it was very very early where I mm. kind of thought, well, all right, Martinez has just joined Villa. Villa had a good opening run, I believe. And oh, I I think that you fall prey to sunk cost fallacy if you are kind of citing minimal core teams for transfers because you fall into a situation. And Rich, I think you mentioned this earlier as well, and maybe it kind of relates to this, where you kind of think that I've said, you know, I've stuck my flag in the fact that these guys are my picks from earlier on, mm-hmm. you know. And anchoring bias, another thing. I you know, these are the guys who I my first things in my first thought were these guys. They're the guys that I've got, and yeah. you you fall prey to all sorts of pitfalls um, through thinking these guys are my core team. You know, it's a no go zone. It's, it's a, it, nothing's going to happen here, and in some ways that could really hurt you 
maybe you could kind of, you know, persevere with a player for too long. I mean, Dave, can you think of a player you've persevered with for too long? <laughs> uh, yes, but I eventually did it as a joke because I was it was well beyond its sell-by date. There was a, a point where mm. I brought in Firmino and then I subbed mm-hmm. him out and he did well. And I was like, you know, I'm going to bring him back in and never bring him back out again. I'm not going to do this hokey-cokey stuff anymore. Yeah. And I kept him in for like 10 game weeks and he didn't do anything and I was like no because last time I took him out he immediately did it and then obviously that's the fallacy that we've been talking about and then and then after a while it just got such a joke that I just left him in <laughs> yeah. and, and I started captaining him and stuff and it went really really weird with it but yeah no it, it happens it happens to everyone that you you it's hard to know when to pull that trigger but usually when you know that you should have pulled the trigger um a, f- a few game weeks ago it's always too late you've all, already the damage is done you've, he's blanked too many times but it, the, i guess that's what this rule is trying to stop or trying to avoid is that um that hokey cokey bit mm-hmm. where i took mm-hmm. him out on a whim because i didn't have x <laughs> player and then and then he he got like 15 <clears throat> points the next game it was so bad um so that's probably where this rule came from actually that exact thing thank you very much for remembering that from two years ago <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like um, but i think the reality is that that rule is so riddled with potential psychological pitfalls that i would be reticent to say that i mean we always at the start of the pre uh, in pre-season think to ourselves all right if i own this guy for 38 game weeks last season i be getting x because that's you know we're looking at a cold set of data now because a lot of the data we're looking at from last year is, is dead it's done it's, it's all over mm. um so for example you know there's a lot of revisionism i think with certain, with certain players yeah, i totally like, agree people kind of turn around and go oh you know what well you know, bruno got 234 44 points and he was you know well the highest point scorer so I should have owned him all season. The reality is, no, like you should have probably have gotten rid of him around game week 30 yes, because after exactly. that, he only returned like 10% of his total points. Yeah, I totally you agree. Fall prey to all of these things, um, looking at the data as it is from last season. And during the season itself, I think you can also fall prey to so many psychological kind of pitfalls in terms of biases and heuristics that I find it difficult to subscribe to the idea that you should have this sort of core team there are two exceptions maybe one exception one exception um which is mo salah um i think salah has just got that pedigree um over the course of the last few years yeah and that kind of shows that even if he's not i know um before anyone starts shouting out i know there was a fallow period last year when he didn't return for seven game weeks like arguably you could have if you were had your crystal ball you could have gone back and kind of gone right sat it out for seven weeks and then soon starts turning out buying back in no yeah. crystal ball though so we're not gonna be able to do that um I did it. Last season was the lowest score. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <fair> <laughs> but it was an accident, kind of. It was when that, that weird wild card situation that happened. Oh, but, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And I remember that. Um, but like, last year was, was his worst season um, in terms of points. But he is still one of those players who, by hook or by crook, always ends up in 200 club. Yeah. Always ends up, um, you know, Touch being me. the stats demon. Always ends up doing basically the job that you want him to do. And... We've had players like this throughout the throughout FPL history, you know, lots of Drogba, the likes of Hazard, um, and you know, in latter days, the likes of Salah, um, Kane obviously returned to prominence this year. Um, so you you will sometimes find players like this, players like Kevin De Bruyne, for example, um, when he had his Yaya year a couple of years ago. Yaya Torre himself back in 2009. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> You will find these players um, that do that job for you and, and, and are basically part of your core team, but they're, they're quite hard to identify and they're very, very rare. And they always tend to be premium players who you're, as you've said, if you basically said through designated them as one of these sort of core players. Yeah, I would say so. Anyway, but yeah, um, I, I'm not too sure about this rule, basically. The next rule is um, to plan your wildcard timing. So I, I guess this would this will go around maybe if we talk about game week one. Uh, when you when you set your game week one team up, do you know when you're going to wildcard, or do you just leave it open ended? It depends on the fixtures. Last year, yeah. 
it was open-ended because there was no kind of prescribed fixture shift. And there are some people who just say, you know what, game week three is the moment because you can make bank. Um, you know, I'm mate Jossie. Um, uh, yeah. He yeah, he loves does it. that every year, doesn't he? And absolutely kills it. Um, FPL Brain as well. He's another player who um, is a bit of a high roller in terms of making money. And he will kind of say to me, yeah, game week three, that's the time to do it because you are kind of going to be sitting on a million, two million rise in one week. And that, that's brilliant. But, I mean, this year, uh, you know, it's, it's hard not to kind of look at Chelsea's turn of fixtures around game week sort of seven, eight time. Yeah. It's hard not to look at Man City also doing exactly the same. And thinking to yourself, well, you know what? These are two kind of big hitting teams that I'm not particularly interested in. Okay, out of the Man City game week two, not particularly interested in. Um, and you know, game week eight seems to lend itself very, very well to a wild card. If you're going to say, right, I'm going to buy Diaz, I'm going to buy whichever City midfielders looking like they're breaking through, whichever Chelsea defenders looking like they're breaking through, and kind of try to, I'm going to try to exploit that run. Um, yeah. So this this year, perhaps it is a case that it's a good idea to be planning um, your wild card, but it's never. I don't think that's a hard and fast rule either. I think I think that's. Um, Something where you can have an idea, yeah. But yeah, yeah I'm not not a hundred percent sure about that. I think I think the you've kind of hit the nail on the head with the caveat, which is which is the fixtures really need to 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 fall nicely yeah. for for it to work. But I do I do subscribe to the idea of um, doing it at the same time every season because you will eventually figure it out a bit more and if, if it's something that you do all the time then you'll be able to see the pitfalls you understand the the basics you you might even be able to set up your game week one team knowing that you only have three weeks so it allows you to do more risky stuff and also it doesn't matter about like if price points i know it's not something that you you subscribe to but um at least the template team to start then turns from game week one to your game week three and by that time you'll have three three weeks on everyone else um so i really do like that so in in in, in regards to this rule the, of the planning part of it um having an idea is obviously something that that most people go into the, the season but but recently i have been doing that game week three thing where i was able to get martinez in i was able to get all these other guys in that everyone wants and it allows you to attack the players going forward um whereas everyone's already trying to get still trying to get the players that you have already got mm. in your team um yeah. but but I think that it's a very, very good caveat of, but if the fixtures have, uh, like there's three more game weeks and then you'll have the best fixture swing ever. And it means that you'll be able to beat or at least gain and then some on the players that have already used their wild card or the managers that have used their wild card game week one to six, for example. And you are able to, you know, beast mode game week seven, three Chelsea players, three City players or whatever. Um, it, it means that you could gain and then some and also you have ev- a double the amount of, of information because there's been double the amount of games. So yeah. I think all of yeah. this points to, you know, we're talking about it. We have thought about it and planning it at least in, in a in a kind of if this happens, then if a, an, an if formula, if you will. Um, so, yeah, I think we're, yeah. we're on the same page. We're just we're just the exact details of it are a bit a bit up in the air. I well, like you... that Tom mentioned Sorry. money at the money there actually because I think coming off the back of last season where we I didn't have too much money but I didn't think about money that much so it's almost something I'd actually forgotten about that one of the advantages of wildcard in early year is building up team value I'd completely forgotten about that yeah it is a good one right let's move on um no team player bias so last season I had this as just no team bias but I've added player in um, and that is simply uh, just because I feel like every season we go into the next season with um, pre-existing ideas of how players are going to do or players are going to be. I'm not saying this in regards of like, oh, Salah's not going to do well just because he did that last well or last season well. It's more like I'm not going to get Ings because he was injured last season even yeah, if he yeah. starts doing well. So it's more of a, um, a negative team player bias as opposed to a positive one. Totally. Yeah. It's a bit of rasa. That's um, something that you need to do every year. And I think that the examples that you gave are perfect examples of why you do that. Because we've all been there. We've all kind of seen the player. We've, we've had preconceived ideas of why we should not own that player. Jesse Lingard, massive example there. Yeah. How many people basically said, 
<laughs> this guy's a joke player. <laughs> he was a joke I'm, player. <laughs> no way I'm signing. There's no way I'm signing him. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter what he does. He can basically, you know, squat overhead kicks from outside the box. Wayne Rooney style um, for a hat trick every week. I won't be signing that guy. Yeah. And the amount of people who folded on that just because of the fact that eventually you have to kind of be bigger than the fact that you've gone have stakes and surprise on something that's on cost the game. It's always useful just to be able to say, you know what? Yeah, you know, what's done is done. Fair enough. And we're all doing it to some extent too. Um, I mean, but I think about Liverpool um, and how bad they did last year um, and the fact that we saw that recency about how they brought it back over the last 10 game weeks or so. Yeah. But the fact is, if you look at last year on the, last year on the whole, I think they finished fourth in terms of FPL points scored. Yeah, they did. Which is just they did okay. unthinkable. But yeah, but that's for Liverpool. That's unthinkable. Um, yeah. They've scored. That's, they 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 didn't score two thousand points for the first time in like four years, and like we're still including their players. We're not kind of saying, you know what? I'm taking in Man United and Chelsea players over them. Man United and Chelsea both scored more points than Liverpool on mass in FPL last year than than Liverpool did. Right. Um, because we we are kind of thinking, you know what? Like it's a new dawn, it's a new day, and I'm still feeling good about these players. Um, and I think that we've got to be able to kind of just say, right, okay, this guy didn't perform for me in the past, but doesn't mean he's not going to perform for me in the future. Yeah. It's also about removing your sense of personal sort of uh, dislike yeah, from players as well. Yeah. That's it. So like Jota, I owned him two game week ones in, uh, in a row, both times, you know, when he was at Wolves. Um, both times I kind of thought the first time I kind of thought, yeah, you know, top scorer in the in the in the championship, he's gonna absolutely smash it. But nothing for five games. We sold him and he scored a brace. Second time round, I thought, you know what, he's he's you know attuned to the division now. It's time for him to go. He's gonna absolutely smash it. Did nothing for three games, we took him out, he scored a brace and he scored a goal and assist. <laughs> so yeah. uh, and he was scoring in Europe. Sorry. I think Sorry. he was scoring in Europe at that time as well, yeah. from from memory anyway. Yeah, he, he couldn't couldn't stop performing against the farmers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, reasonably, you could be saying, and I think actually brought him in last year, the week before. I remember I was driving driving uh, home actually, and I remember how, like literally punching the steering wheel because it was like there is one injury this week. It's Diego Jota who's uh, managed to <laughs> do his ankle in. He might he might miss. He's going to miss the end of the season and could miss Portugal in the Euros. And I brought him in like the week before. Like, I got in the two. I, you know you know what he's like yeah. an epic points dodger. But you've got to be thinking as well, like, you know, the, the classic analytics point of view that he's getting in the right position. So that's reassuring. Yeah. Make yourself feel <laughs> the, better. A little pat on the back. Like, oh, yeah, you know, his XG there's, was there's, good. There's an element of, of our Morata about him um, and yeah. that he gets into those positions and that's absolutely fantastic. But he maybe misses the quality to finish those chances. But yeah. you've got to be thinking that, you know, he's there for a reason. He's not a terrible player. Liverpool have got like, a great scouting system. But I've got loads of reasons to be aggrieved about Jota. But I'm still happy to look at him again this year because of how good Liverpool starting pitches are and the fact that he at 7.5 especially if Firmino is going to be kind of walked back in terms of his you know, playing for Liverpool or at least he's going to like, share time with Jota or whatever, whatever like a player like that has to be looked at again and you know you mentioned the Ings example Dave like I yeah. completely screwed up that year I didn't look at Ings at all because I was I kept, kind of kept kind of thinking right they scored again yeah but he's going to be injured soon yeah. and he, he never did and, yeah, um, a full, we've full, got to be adaptive. Yeah, a full year. I think he went with with playing at least a little bit of minutes in every single game. Um, who would have thought it? But yeah, no, I'd say I'm 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 glad that you've 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 reconciled with your jaw thing and and you're not putting emotion to it. It's almost like th- these rules are are a little bit like like don't have emotion, <laughs> which is which is interesting. Yeah. Um, from a from an autistic point of view, for myself, I've I've written rules and I've just realised that. Now. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so uh let's move on rich yeah so the the final one is is basically it's your rule tom so your rule to bring to the table i know dave only told you a few minutes before we started recording i told him literally yesterday because he asked <laughs> <laughs> and i should have told him well before <laughs> you take it so personally dave i'm only joking <laughs> i'm upset so my question to you guys before i kind of disclose what this rule is is what keeps you going over 38 game weeks? Is it content creation or is it something else? For me, it's content creation. Right. Uh, Rich? See, mine's not, because um, obviously I've only been doing this a year. Yeah. 
No, exactly. But it's it's, it's a hard one to answer. That's what I'm interested to hear. It's a hard one to answer because I've obviously had bad seasons before, but never that bad. So I wonder if I wasn't doing the pod, how I'd have reacted, whether I'd have just given up. Um, yeah. gen- generally, I think it's the mini leagues I was in or am still in with my friends, like on WhatsApp and them taking the piss might yeah. motivate me. But So okay. it's, it's, so it's, it's trying not to be bullied for rich is, is what I'm Yeah, hearing. basically. <laughs> just, yeah. Okay. Kind of trying to keep some kind of, I can of bully pride. you in other ways. If, if you start to <laughs> feel in la- lack of motivation, I can go for it. <laughs> um, mine is 100% beating my workmates. Like I, th- I'm pretty sure it is. I, I do like the content creation, and I, I really enjoy the the interactions and stuff. But I would do. I think if I wasn't doing FPL, if I if I decided, you know what, I'm just too bad at it, or I can't be bothered anymore, I'd probably just do podcasts mm. about other things. I really like that part of it. Um, mm. but the FPL thing, the motivation is is being able to walk in, uh, on a <laughs> third year in a row in work and being like. Yeah like yeah. try to be humble but i'm really bad at being humble so i eventually just smile like a giddy school child and i'm like yep i did bring in bail like and and, uh, and particularly last season was was being james copeland every single week that was that was a treat <laughs> so good all right no fair enough fair enough no i think that that's probably about right i think for me um when I was looking how I define this rule, I did a lot of research. I was looking around, you know, I did a lot of Googling, <laughs> got some books out as well, um, started reading about, you know, philosophy, um, about history, and <laughs> lots of different sort of ways in which you can define these things. And I found this amazing Irish philosopher from the noughties, um, a, a guy called Ronan Keating. <laughs> and do not do he it. said, Please don't do it. Life is a roller coaster. <laughs> Just got to ride it. <laughs> and I feel that that's Dude. something you need to bear in mind when you play FPL. Like, I'm, I, I think that one of my pet peeves is when I go on Twitter and I see a, like, a really, like, uh, you know, a really, like, whiny, melodramatic kind of tweet going, it's all over. I'm done. You know, I, oh, I've, I've scored 40 points. I've got, I've got a 5K. I've got 5 million rent this game week. Oh, I hate FPL. I'm done. You know, it's all over. <laughs> And you'll see two weeks later, they'll be like, oh, actually, I'm back because I've, um, you know, I've, I've just got two 70 points in a row. So uh, my rank's actually all right. So, yeah, I'm back, guys. <laughs> like, just just go over it. Like, at the end of the day, there's going to be highs and lows in the FPL season. Just accept that. And the mm-hmm. fact is that, yeah, you're going to be, you know, personally affected if you are into it as we are. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, you've got to accept the fact that there's going to be highs and lows. And if you look at things like, you know, your uh, XG rank or your expected rank versus your actual rank, like I, I completely, I, I love, you know, uh, FPL review, for example, but, but I mean, Dave, you're a gamer. I am. Like, FPL, like if you look at expected rank and you look at things like that, that's basically if I was playing FPL on, if I was playing FPL on story mode. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I because it. it's Solo. just that, that if Single everything player. was easy, if yeah. everything went my way. And the fact is that FPL is so difficult because things don't go your way. And there's nothing you can actually do about the fact that FPL is not going to go your way. Yeah. Because yeah. once, once the deadline's gone, that's it. You're, it's all over. You've got you have an illusion of control, but you've got no more control. Life is a roller coaster. you just got to ride it. You know? Enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And I think you've just got to be like conscious of the fact that some, some game weeks aren't going to go your way. Some are. Um, and I think it's about trying to keep a level head throughout the season. The fact is that we've got certain motivations that are going to keep us here. We're, yeah. we're content creators, and I'm going to be here this time next season, probably, hopefully. Um, yeah. um, and you guys probably are as well. Yeah. But the fact is, if, you, if you're an individual who's playing FPL <laughs> and you're getting upset about things or whatever, my biggest point is always that brilliant phrase from uh, from sir ronan which is literally the fact that you you basically need to sorry uh, which is encapsulated by what ronan says uh, yeah. because at the end of the day you, you've got to be able to kind of say to yourself okay i've had a bad game week but there's always a good game week to come yeah and like you don't have you shouldn't overreact to one thing you shouldn't take it that seriously i like it and if it is to overtaking your life and if it is affecting your mood then step away from FPL, do something else. Yeah, 
Yeah. No, I totally get it. So in a nutshell, it is literally just like you're, there's going to be ups and downs like everything else. It's not a game like single player. You can't just you can't just play and then oh no, I'll load it and stuff. So you are going to get disappointed because it is a very um, big mirror from life. I totally understand. Um, I think Rich is. Oh no, he's back. Rich is going to be back to say hello or say goodbye. I've muted him though, so I wonder if he'll figure that out. But um, to, oh no, he's actually delete. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually away <laughs> all right well i think we're gonna stop it there apologies for the the ending there i think rich's computer is blowing up um he he wrote in saying that his computer is too hot so and he is in the boiler room guys <laughs> um but Tom, i want to thank you so much for for coming through and uh speaking to us about it again um some really really good insight there as well i always enjoy speaking to you man Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, hopefully, um, I will be on you. That sounds really awkward. I, d- I don't want to be on you guys during the season. No, no, hopefully I get I'll it. Be I, I'm on, on with you guys during the season, or vice versa. <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks for having me on as always. Um, I like yeah. the fact that this half an hour chat has turned into more than an hour. I'm not sure if that's just me BSing on or whether it was actually interesting. If, if it um, wasn't hopefully interesting, it was I would guys, have interrupted I you. Yeah, no, no, don't, don't you worry. I, I, I love it. And we are going to have that, that Matrix co- conversation off air definitely at some point, especially over our beer. But anyway, okay. I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Remember, you can subscribe if you'd like. We're going to do videos like this and other ones. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be doing some really really cool things with forming fixtures and all that good stuff so links in description blah 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 we'll see you next time thanks very much and up the pod <laughs>